The year is 1998. Up until now, while narration and plot have been attempted in first-person shooters, it's been pretty shallow. As John Carmack once put it, story in a video game is like story in a peculiar kind of medium. However, using the Quake engine and some code taken from Quake 2, Valve would go on to change that with a game called Half-Life. For better and sometimes worse, it shaped a lot of the linear narrative type of shooter as we know it. Enter 2012, and a mod effort was underway to remake that original game using the Half-Life 2 engine and new art assets. Recently, an official release was made on Steam with Valve's obvious blessing. This remake, of course, is called Black Mesa, and it seeks to recreate the magic of the original. The only question is, is it successful, or are there unforeseen consequences from such an effort? Oh, Gordon. If I had known it was you, I would have let you in. Judging from my description of Half-Life, it shouldn't be a surprise that Black Mesa is a resource management game where you try to manage a shopping mall and try to make it the prettiest and frilliest in all the land. I'm just checking to see if any of you are actually paying attention to anything I'm saying. Obviously, like the original, it's a first-person shooter with emphasis on narrative. It's on the linear end of the spectrum favoring plot structure. It's also a bit of a slow burn since for the first part of the game, you don't even get a weapon. You're on rails being shown around the Black Mesa facility. While I'm sure this can be boring for some, it's good for plot structure since it gives you a feel for the world around you. Naturally, you'll be exploring many of the environmental types it shows off at times, so it's good to get a sneak peek while you can. Being a remake of the original Half-Life, your arsenal consists fairly strictly of weapons you found in the original Half-Life. If you were hoping to use the gravity gun to raise some chaos, I'm sorry to disappoint, but it didn't exist in this part of the timeline. Your first weapon is, of course, the Humble Crowbar. It's perhaps even more iconic than the Gravity Gun since Splinter Cell Chaos Theory and Bioshock actually sort of poke fun of it. It's just a melee weapon, but the fact that it doesn't consume ammo makes it perfect for opening vents or crates. You can also use it on headcrabs and headcrab zombies if you're feeling up to it. The Glock 17 is your first ranged weapon, obviously being the weak pistol option. It's more or less your fallback weapon if you run out of ammo for more powerful types. Like Doom, it actually shares an ammo type with a rapid-fire weapon, so it might actually lose its use once you get it apart from having more controlled firing. On the plus side, though, it can be fired underwater, so it's very good to have in some circumstances. The MP5 is the weapon in question that shares the same ammo type. It's basically like the equivalent in Half-Life 2, where it's a submachine gun and comes with a grenade launcher. Generally, it's useful for enemy mobs, and the grenades especially can come in handy for tankier enemies. The SPAS-12 is the shotgun, so of course I absolutely love it. You have to reload each shell though, so best not to let it go completely dry and always make sure it's fully reloaded during downtimes. Naturally, you can fire one shell or with the alt fire too. That means it's kinda like the shotgun and super shotgun rolled into one. Kinda. It doubles rather than triples the damage, so it's not nearly as OP as Doom's super shotgun, but having double the firepower is still really handy for beefier enemies. The crossbow is probably one of the more interesting ones that would later end up in Half-Life 2. It's essentially your sniper rifle weapon. Perhaps somewhat funnily, it's claimed to have tranquilizer darts, but they're no less lethal than any of your other weapons. Then again, it's actually explained as a neurotoxin that may be more lethal than intended against human-sized targets. Either way, if you need to hit something relatively slow moving at a distance, this is your weapon to use, but it's a projectile, so anything quick moving won't be as viable to use on. You've also got three different types of thrown explosives that all have one thing in common. I didn't use them that often. Grenades are your typical throw or roll variety that you can, of course, cook to detonate faster. It seems trip mines and satchels serve as proximity and remote bombs, respectively. The trip mines you throw down and it blows up if anyone's near it, and the satchel you have to blow up yourself. I pretty much looked this up because I tended to not use them and I kind of forgot which was which. Maybe I should have used them more, who knows? Naturally, you can also have a rocket launcher, and it operates the same as it does in both games. Namely, you can fire it straight, or you can choose to have it manually guided by your mouse. Typically, it's better to be manually guided unless you plan to hide behind something and trust it to hit something straight ahead. Obviously, it's great for things like helicopters and tanks, which is about what I mostly use them for. You also have the Magnum, of course. Very powerful handgun, but the ammo is the most plentiful, so in other words, I hesitated to use it. What can I say, I'm a very stingy guy, even if it's the final boss. Well, judging by the memes around the internet, I'm not the only one. The first of the alien weapons is a snark. 
No, not a vocal tone. These little guys tend to be enemies, but you can also acquire some to throw yourself. Basically annoying little enemies that bounce around that serve as both enemies and your own weapon. Just yeet them at the nearest target, but you have to make sure there's actually a threat because they can apparently turn on you if they don't have anything else to attack. I guess they were never really your ally, they were just getting their aggression out on something else. The Tau Cannon is pretty neat to fire in its charge attack and dish out damage if you're careful not to overcharge it, but it's not as helpful. The ammo type isn't the most common, so you'll want to save it for when you actually need it. Still, it can be pretty fun to muck around with. The Gluon Gun is the closest thing to the BFG in this game, essentially a high-powered laser beam. It's for when you really need something in front of you dead, or you happen to be in Zen where ammo is far more plentiful. Of course, I've saved my favorite for last, and it is the penultimate Hive Hand. Okay, so it's not actually the most powerful in the world, but it has one really major thing going for it, infinite ammo. As in, the bugs that make up its attack will return to you after a short while, meaning it just operates on a recharge. The standard fire actually has them home in on enemies, while alt fire has them fire straight ahead. There are times, of course, where you don't want it to auto home and need a priority target gone. It also helps that the alt fire shoots a lot faster, so it's great in a jam. In addition to ammo, you have both health and suit power, the latter obviously serving as armor, and you can find power ups for both in addition to recharge stations. It's standard if you've played either Half Life game. The enemies mostly revolve around aliens and military. Headcrabs, of course, are the most basic enemy type. They try to jump at your face. They're pretty agile and annoying, but not too dangerous. You can try to bash them with your crowbar if you're up for it, but it's better to use your pistol or another basic firearm. Hound eyes are actually exclusive to the original Half-Life, although we're apparently planned to be in Half-Life 2 at some point. They're canine-like little things with a face full of eyeballs, and they attack you by trying to air blast you away. Or at least that's what it looks like to me. It could be some kind of psychic blast, but I choose to go with the Avatar The Last Airbender reference. Just please don't harm my cabbages, okay? Next up is the Bull Squid. Not one of my favorites to go up against due to their corrosive acid, but at least it can be dodged. They're pretty beefy, so I tend to use the shotgun or something else that's damaging if they're farther back. They're not really too big of a problem, but they can get on your nerves if you aren't prepared for them. Next up, of course, is the Barnacle. At first glance, they might not seem like a problem at all, since they're just Venus flytraps on the ceiling. Of course, if you happen to get caught up in one, they can be quite irritating. One nice trick, though, is that you can trick them into grabbing objects. This is handy if you don't feel like putting up with them and just want to pass before they realize they've been duped. Naturally, I mentioned snarks can be enemies as much as they can be a weapon, and they're annoying little pests when they're enemies. They will hop around like they're on a double shot of espresso blended into a Red Bull. As if that wasn't good enough, they can self-destruct, too. Best to deal with quicker rather than later, something that can fire quickly like the MP5 can be effective. Itch thigh sores of the underwater terror acting sort of like the barracuda sharks from Quake 2. In other words, they hit fast and they hit hard. As I mentioned though, you can use your pistol underwater, so it's a decent option here. So I know Futurama said thou shalt love the tentacle, but in this case the tentacles can burn in hell. Or at least they can burn to jet fuel. Seriously though, these freaky live scythes can be a real menace. They appear in a few places including Zen, but at least they're pretty rare to appear. Best to keep away from their striking range if you can. Later on, you run into things like trip mines and turrets. They both operate on a laser beam of sorts with the trip mines blue and the turrets red. Either one you want to avoid tripping, but at least you can shoot the mines from a distance. Well, mostly. There's a section where it's so packed full of explosives that triggering anything will kill you. One nice thing, though, is that you can pick up turrets to use for your own purposes up until they're destroyed or run out of ammo anyway. Just be careful, they don't distinguish friend from foe and could attack you or friendlies. Then you've got the Marines, probably the most annoying enemy in the game to fight against. That's not to say it isn't warranted. After all, as the name suggests, they're trained US Marines, so it's expected that they'd be a force to be reckoned with. Even so, rapid fire hit scanners in a game with static health isn't the most fun. Then again, you can say the same for the Combine in Half-Life 2, and these Marines even very much seem to be operating on Combine AI, so I can't really say anything too harsh. There's also tanks and helicopters to deal with, of course. And then you've got the Black Ops, basically ninja-like enemies that like to jump around and fire their Glock or grenades on you. Hurry up and put these guys out of your misery, preferably with the MP5 or something else that can work around their speed. Then, of course, you've got the Gargantua, the big behemoth that uses a flamethrower type of weapon. 
Well, it is possible to kill it with explosives or radiation, your best bet is to run for the hills. There's typically an environmental solution for killing them the few times you encounter them, and that's probably better than taking up ammo on them. Alien grunts are apparently bioengineered vortigons, so basically they're like the combine would later be. They've got their own hive hands, but thankfully they don't know how to use the homing function. Just avoid their shots and retaliate with heavy enough firepower, as they can be a bit tanky. Now most of the game is about traversing the environment and solving a small puzzle here and there. Typically that's just going forward, but occasionally you have to do things like get the ingredients of a jet engine up and running to burn some tentacles with. The Black Mesa remake also takes advantage of the Source engine's physics, so there's also some Half-Life 2S puzzles here and there, like connecting a cable to an outlet. Nothing all that complex, but it breaks up the fighting so it's not purely action. The real meat of Black Mesa, especially the Steam version though, is Zen. The original Half-Life Zen was fairly basic, and when it was a freebie mod, Black Mesa ended short of Zen. This retail version seems to understand that and has added enough Zen to try to justify the purchase. There's actually a pretty lengthy amount to it. You still get the long jump module for going long distances with, of course, just like in the original. There are also crystals everywhere, some that restore health or suit power, and some that actually restore some of your ammo, which is quite nice. Zen also has its own unique versions of enemies. Namely, you've got tree roots that attack you, can be stunned by normal shots, and gibbleted by explosives. Hot eyes are just a pure nightmare from hell, as they can kamikaze you if they get the chance. Try to induce an explosion on them at a safe distance if you can. Knockback hound eyes aren't nearly as bad as that, but they can aggressively knock you back as the name implies if you aren't careful. Beneathicals are basically underwater barnacles that consist of octopus tentacles. You really don't want to get grabbed by them, so shoot to kill on sight. Alien controllers are basically like octobrains on Duke Nukem, flinging stuff at you but also using their electrical waves to try to control nearby Vortigaunt with. It's best to kill them, which frees the Vortigaunts they're controlling. You head through various places in Zen, such as a research lab with HEV zombies and a factory the Vortigaunts are forced to labor in. You'll certainly be doing a lot of jumping, following veins to pop little nodes, and of course contending with the local wildlife. If you fall into the void below, you're basically dumped to the last checkpoint A quick save is if you died, so try not to. They must have really wanted you to get your money's worth, since Zen stretches on for far longer than you may think. I'd actually consider it the second half of the game, rather than just the last chapter. Gonark serves as essentially the mini-boss and chases you for quite a bit until you're actually able to fight back. Then, of course, you've got the penultimate boss, the Nihilanth. You have to deal with its attacks, including telekinetically throwing large objects from Earth at you while whittling it and its Zen crystals and defenses down in order to win. Ultimately, Black Mesa's gameplay is very refined and smooth. It makes great use of the Source engine, unlike the infamous Half-Life Source in its early days, and adds just enough over the mod to justify getting. All of the workshop mods, both official and otherwise, are only icing on the cake, and it even seems to come with multiplayer. If you want to experience Half-Life 1 and you loved Half-Life 2, I heavily recommend it. It does a great job representing Half-Life 1's type of structure and narrative while adding enough modern elements that it feels like a love letter to both Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 fans. In my arbitrary scoring system, I give it 10 crowbars over Headcrab. As you probably expected, it follows the plot beats of the original for the most part. Obligatory spoiler warning, the timestamps are there for a reason if you want to avoid the spoilers. Please note that failure to heed this warning will result in an unsatisfactory mark upon your employment record, followed by G-Man coming for you in the worst manner possible. Anyway, Gordon Freeman is a theoretical physicist. That is to say, he's supposed to be a physicist of theoretical physics, but I think it's more like he's just theoretically a physicist because it's an informed superpower. The PS2 version's hazard course explains away Gordon being good with guns is accidentally being given security training, but let's just chalk it up to being an FPS protagonist. In any case, Gordon is sent to the esteemed Black Mesa where he's involved in delivering materials within a radioactive chamber. After fetching his suit, he sets out to do just that. However, things, as you may have expected, go horribly wrong. The whole place collapses, and it seems the material caused a chain reaction that opened up portals into another world. Thus, Gordon has to fight his way through aliens and try to reach the surface. The science team is certain that they'll be rescued by the Marines, but tragedy strikes as it's revealed their cleanup orders involve offing the scientists. Thus, Gordon is enemies with the military too, or at least these ones specifically. After enough fighting as well as launching a shuttle and other things, Gordon makes his way into Zen. 
He has to make his way through the research areas where the scientists initially explored Zen as well as various natural environments and even through Vortigon territory. Gordon makes his way through a factory where the Vortigon are forced to work for Nihilanth, turning their own into alien grunts among other things. Taking down Nihilanth, the fabled G-Man finally appears for real. He offers you to join him, but he does reveal in the second game that this choice was an illusion. Refusing causes him to seemingly dump you into a hopeless fight back on Zen, so yeah. And that's the end of Black Mesa's plot. I didn't really go into a super lot of detail for it given it's a plot-based game, but the plot really isn't that intricate. After all, given how aged the game is, it's probably to be expected that the story would be reasonably light. Not to mention, too much convoluted writing can have the opposite effect. For its time, it was a good involved plot, and Black Mesa does an excellent job retelling it pretty much beat for beat. Well, besides their own little additions, of course, mostly to Zen, but everything feels like it fits just fine. The plot by today's standards isn't anything to write home about, but keep in mind when the original was made. Back then, most people's idea of a first-person shooter was Doom and Quake. With that in mind, it was likely a breath of fresh air, and the story is perfectly fine for what it is. It doesn't get in the way of the gameplay, and it manages to feel like you're fighting for something more than just blindly shooting. I know this is the biggest shocker of the entire review, but Black Mesa looks slightly better graphically than the original Half-Life. I know, it's such a bombshell revelation, but it's really true, so get your jaw off the ground. All joking aside, you can probably see that with your own eyes, that going from essentially the Quake 2 engine to the latest iteration of Source 1 made a slight difference. The tram ride is actually the perfect place for showing that off, too, as I'm sure it did an effective job showing off the environments in the original back in the day. Across the board, all models are given far more polygons to work with, from the first-person models to the character models to the environments themselves. It's hardly just adding more edge loops to what was already there either, the environments really go from looking like square level designs to actually looking lived in. The environments really look like they serve a purpose now, and that's especially showcased in the latter half of the game. The characters also look more unique, and the entities that also exist in Half-Life 2 like enemies and certain characters were made to look more like those counterparts. The incident in the beginning of the game especially shows off the particle system very well, and unlike Half-Life Source, all the game is improved uniformly, so certain aspects like improved water don't look weirdly out of place. Just like in the original, of course, there's a good variety of environments on display here, too. From the desert-like surface to the waterlogged areas underground to more technical areas, you're never staring at the same thing for too long. You even go into heavily irradiated areas at points with a screen filling with static and a very audible Geiger counter to effectively donate the sense of danger. Launching the shuttle was especially a good looking sight, it was a real spectacle that I was genuinely looking forward to when I saw it coming. Of course, the presentation really shines in Zen. It goes from a drab selection of platforms to a genuinely gorgeous alien planet full of life and whimsical mystery. It actually looks like a planet that creatures of various kinds can live in, a real ecosystem. The differing parts of it, like the research labs with the unsettling HEV zombies and the pretty sad factory, also contribute a lot to it. This is, of course, all cultivating in the final fight against Nihilanth. It looks disturbing in the original, but here, let's just say the fetal similarities are really on display. As a collective whole, though, Black Mesa is a very big improvement over the original in terms of graphics. I know, that's quite a shocker, isn't it? Audio-wise, it's quite well done in that field, too. The soundtrack is actually very nice to listen to, and there's a decent amount of dialogue added just for this. Barney the guard calling Gordon a sellout for cutting his ponytail was pretty amusing and gave some more familiarity to his character as opposed to just being a generic guard NPC. I've got nothing to say about sound effects, which means they're just fine. Nothing out of the ordinary here, for better or worse. To sum it up, Black Mesa is quite a treat for both the eyes and ears. It improves things pretty drastically, especially visually, but also in terms of music. The gameplay additions are quite nice, but presentation really is most of the reason you'd want to play a remake. Ideally, gameplay changes should be relatively minimal and in service to what made the original special, with the presentation being the biggest change. I'm happy to report that that's the case here. Every moment in the remake is a sight to behold. You can tell it was lovingly crafted from the ground up, and it's a real night and day difference to Half-Life Source that, for the most part, shoved the assets into a new engine and called it a day. Ultimately, Black Mesa succeeds at just about everything it set out to do. The goal was to make a solid remake of Half-Life, and I'd say they did a really good job bringing it all together. 
Not only are the visuals surprisingly top-notch for Source Engine 1, it makes great use of the physics engine and a variety of other things. Compared to the infamous Half-Life Source, it's certainly the best you can get in terms of Half-Life on the Source Engine. While you can get most of the game for free in a slightly less polished mod form, I think Zen alone is worth the game if you can spare the funds for it. This has been my review of Black Mesa. Thank you so much for tuning in with me. More Zelda Skyward Sword HD livestream in action tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Let's Plays every single day, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And more news next Sunday at 6 p.m. All Eastern Standard Time, subscribe and hit the bell icon to keep notified, and head crab pounce that like while you're at it. Thanks for tuning in with me, Capitalize on Life, and I'll see you next time. Warning.